Well, hello everyone. Welcome back to Near Replicant on Playframe. We stand before the gates of the Shadow Lord's castle. But first, who's interested in some reading? Yes, indeed. We have all of the weapons, all 33, I want to say, that there are in the video game. 100%, which is what matters. And as we saw way earlier in this playthrough, so long ago, I can barely even remember, they got stories attached to them. And as you level the weapons up, you get more access to the stories. Now, I've not leveled up all of these weapons because I'm not a madman. And uh, <laughs> I, as you've also seen, leveling up weapons requires an extreme amount of grinding. I spent a long time gathering materials and resources to level up just my favorite spear and like just the one weapon. That took possibly hours? Yeah, I think that's safe to say that took at least an hour or two to grind up all the, no, longer than that, two to three, to grind all the materials required to level up one weapon. I can't imagine who and or why. <laughs> why would anyone do this? You shouldn't. What you should do instead is what I'm about to do, which is look up the full stories on the internet and read them to you now so we can all enjoy the stories. So, before we go in and see another ending, let's see all the cool stories attached to these weapons. And these stories were not in the original Nier either. They were in, like, supplemental materials, like uh, a book that got released later. I think they wanted to put them in to the game at some point because that was sort of a Drakengard tradition, but for whatever reason they just didn't. So, uh, now we have them here. So, let's begin with the Nameless Blade. I'm not even going to scroll down. I'm just going to be reading from this uh, internet thing in front of me. A computer is what it's called, but um, <laughs> you'll you'll get the idea. So, smash, 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 smash. Sweat rolls down the faces of hard scrabble men as they chip away at ironstone. Their cheerful singing echoing through the mine. We are workers, workers in the mine, dirty from tip to toe. Again today we search for iron with all of our might. Smash, 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 smash. Then level two. Foom, 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 foom. The sound of women stomping on bellows in the mill. The sound of iron being gathered from the scorched sands. We are workers, workers in the mill. Workers who send wind. Today we stomp the bellows again with all our might. Foom, 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 foom. Then at level three, clang, 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 clang. The sound of swordsmiths wielding hammers at their forges. The ringing of such transformative blows is stunning indeed. We are swordsmiths, swordsmiths who bring blades to life. Lords of steel, clang, 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 clang. And the final uh, level four, all of these can be leveled up to level four, as far as I know. Rip, rip. 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 The sound of flesh being rent on the battlefield. The sound of killing enemies. Killing someone. Killing humans. Someone help me. It hurts. It hurts so much. Help me, mommy. Rip. 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 I guess I should have warned you before also, these stories are going to be extremely near in tone. <laughs> I'm guessing every single one of them. If we manage to find- here, we will all count how many weapons and how many weapon stories are not sad or depressing. We'll keep a count as we go. I'm guessing it's not going to be a large number. Anyway, next weapon, let's go for the Lily Leaf Sword. Level one, as you can see. Uh, okay. I love him with all my heart, as he does me. When we cross paths outdoors, he sends signals with his eyes that only I can understand. He treasures my gifts so much, he keeps them locked away in a safe. Oh, I couldn't ask for a better lover. Level 2. I can't believe this. My best friend deceived the love of my life and stole him from me. One moment he was there, and the next he was gone. All that remains are some of my gifts, which are scattered across his empty room. Everything else of value has been sold at the village marketplace. Level 3. This will not stand. He hasn't abandoned me, he's just being tricked by that woman. I know he still has feelings for me. He must. I'm far more beautiful than she is, and he knows it. Oh yes, he knows. But I must make him see the truth, and quickly. 
I have to get her away from him. I have to kill her. Kill. Hurry up and kill. At level four. Consumed by her madness, the woman slaughtered the young husband and wife, hacking them with such force that the blade of her sword warped. The woman then went into hiding, leaving behind only clumps of unrecognizable meat and a sword with a horribly bent blade. But no matter how many smiths attempted to repair the sword, it never again retained its original shape. Count still at zero so far. This brings us to the Nirvana Dagger, a really weird shaped one in general. Level one. The girl had been betrothed to a local lord on the day of her birth. As she grew, her days were taken up studying proper bridal technique, while her evenings were spent staring out her bedroom window and offering prayers for her betrothed to the night sky. Oh my lord, if only you would come to me but a single day sooner. Level 2. Her home was occupied by several other girls her age. Each one shared the same betrothed, and spent her days studying bridal techniques and her evenings praying to the night sky. Oh my lord, if only you would come to me but a single day sooner. Level 3. One day, a quarrel broke out, as the girls argued that only the greatest among them could become their lord's betrothed. None would yield an inch, each asserting only they alone could possibly satisfy him. Seeing this, their caretaker said in a kind voice, Worry not, girls, each and every one of you shall surely become a bride to our lord. Hearing this, every face lit up in an expression of pure joy. Level 4. On the day they were to be married, the girls were brought to a place of cobbled stone they could see from the windows of their home. A single dagger was then placed before them, and the girls were told they needed to end their life here and now if they wished to meet their betrothed. Upon hearing this news, the girls scrambled to seize the dagger from one another, plunging it into their chest the moment they held it. Years later, a temple named the Betrothed was built on the spot where the girls took their own lives. Sensing a theme? All right, next weapon. This is going to be a while, by the way, honestly. <laughs> is this going to be a whole episode actually just reading these? It might be. That would be silly, but we'll find out together, won't we? I hope you're enjoying it either way. And if you aren't, well, skip to the end to see if we actually get it, got any further than just reading descriptions. <laughs> next weapon, the Moonrise. I'm having to switch between holding my controller and, <laughs> and this laptop here. Level one. There's a legend of long ago that speaks of a nation threatened by a great inferno. This nation, however, was saved from eternal hellfire by a sword with the power to freeze anything. Around this sword stood thousands upon thousands of ice sculptures. Level 2. A man on a journey to seek out weapons eventually discovered the sword. He wrapped it in several layers of cloth and took it with him, placing it in the bag he carried upon his back. But before the man realized what was happening, the cloth, the sword, and his own body ended up frozen solid. Level 3. A traveling shrine maiden eventually discovered the sword. She offered a prayer to her god and gripped the hilt, but cold instantly shot through her fingers and into her body, freezing her solid. In her final moments, the shrine maiden unleashed words of great blasphemy to the god who had failed her. And Level 4. An enslaved woman in a mine eventually discovered the sword. Desiring an easy death over the continuation of her daily suffering, she grasped the weapon firmly. And while the woman did not freeze, she was also unable to pierce her own flesh. Soon, moonlight shone upon the blade of the weapon, reflecting the sight of the woman being beaten and dragged away by her master. Now that just seems unnecessarily mean. Next weapon, the Rebirth. Another very strange looking one. Level 1. That's right, this here's the weapon that'll be ending your life. Ah, don't sweat it, there's nothing to worry about. It'll be a pain the likes of which you've never felt before. In fact, you won't even feel pain at first. It'll be more like water sliding across your skin. Honestly, for most folks, it ain't the pain that makes them scream. It's the sight of their own blood flowing out of them. Level 2. Yeah, it won't end so easy. See this part of the blade right here? This part hurts like a real son of a bitch. It's my favorite, which is why I always save it for last. I like to use it after people's voices get too hoarse and you can't tell what they're saying, which is a real... Fucking hell, are you ever loud? Mind piping down over there? You're gonna make my hand slip. Level 3. I won't kill you right away, so don't worry about a thing there, champ. I'm gonna take my sweet time before you finally give up the ghost. Honestly, you'd be surprised how much it takes to kill a person. I mean, think about it. People got two eyes, or most of them anyway, and two ears, ten fingers, ten toes. 
20 nails across the lot. And don't even get me started on the joints, because folks got hundreds of the damn things. Yeah, we got plenty of ways to keep ourselves entertained. And level four. Huh? Why am I doing this? Now, ain't that a question? Buddy, I'm just doing what you've been doing for a good long while now. Nabbing innocent citizens on fake charges, torturing them, and putting their severed heads on display. Does that ring any bells, buddy? It should, because it was all you. I guess maybe you forgot about all that, huh? That's okay. I'll spend all the time it takes to make sure you remember every last thing you did to my wife and daughter. <laughs> Tally's still at zero for those of you running the count. Anyway, Earthworm's Claw. Level one. An elderly scholar sits in the dim reference room of a moldy museum. Before him lies a single box which has long been sealed away. It's an article the museum's previous curator made abundantly clear should never be opened. Level 2. It is said the box contains a fossil that drinks the blood of humans. What foolishness. One would think we as people would have outgrown such nonsense. Only someone who spends all their life surrounded by books could possibly believe such preposterous superstition. Level 3. He opens the box, which spits forth a cloud of dust and beholds a single stone of bizarre shape. Looking at the attached handle, one could easily conclude it was used in some manner of ceremony. However, it could also be viewed as a weapon. And what a fascinating shape. Yes, this will require rigorous research indeed. Level 4. How foolish everyone was to be afraid of something like this. The scholar chuckles softly to himself as he reaches up and gouges out his left eye with the fossil's tip. Next up, the Blade of Treachery. I got a good feeling based on the name. Level 1. The sisters were puppets of complex machinery. So fine was their construction that any who laid eyes upon them assumed they were human in every way. They were the embodiment of man's greatest technological achievements. They walked like humans, ate like humans, laughed like humans. The one thing they could not do, however, was shed tears, for they were not designed that way. Level 2. Because the sisters were machines, they felt nothing. Oh, they might mourn as humans did, but they experienced no true sadness, for they did not know what sadness was. Even when their friends perished in tragic accidents and their creator died of disease, they felt nothing. To the sisters, all it meant was that those people no longer existed. Level 3. It was a warm spring's day when a lone cat wandered into their home. It was a scrawny, filthy thing riddled with disease. What a bother, the sisters thought as they looked down at the wretched creature. But they fed it milk and wiped it clean, kept it warm, and soon the cat was well again. From that day forth, it would linger wherever the sisters were, brushing against their legs when it wanted food. If it caught a mouse, it would bring it back to boast its prowess. If it wanted love, it would cry out to them in a mewling voice. Level 4 It was a cold winter's day when the cat came into their house, let out a feeble squeak, and died. Time and again did the younger sister shake the cat's body, and time and again did the elder sister call out to it, but the cat neither moved nor responded. In that moment, the sisters felt as though they felt something break deep inside their chests, and from that day forth, they truly felt nothing at all. Next up, the Beast Bane. Long ago, in a faraway kingdom, there lived three brothers. The middle brother was a famous general who commanded a vast army. People everywhere were terrified of his troops, for they were most violent indeed. Level 2. This general loved to make war. He enjoyed nothing more than watching cities burn and corpses pile up. And he fought not to subjugate, but simply to destroy all that he could. His well-trained soldiers laid waste to towns, cities, and even nations for the sake of their general. And as they hewed and hacked and chopped, the general would chuckle to himself in the most vulgar of tones. Level 3. The army marched on and on. Nations by the sea, nations in the mountains, nations in the desert, nations in the tundra, and nations to the east and to the west. The general cared not. He simply wished to watch it all burn. His orders were absolute, and for years beyond counting, the soldiers killed and killed and killed and killed and killed and killed and killed. And killed. Level 4. After some time, the army arrived in a certain nation. They killed its soldiers, they killed its townspeople, 
They killed its princesses and princes and dukes and bakers and lawyers and accountants and beggars and thieves. Eventually, a shabby general came pleading for his life with tears in his eyes, but they killed him as well. However, the soldiers thought he seemed familiar and tried to recall how they might have known him. In that moment, however, the general's daughter appeared, and they became so engrossed in ending her life they never thought about the matter again. Next up, Faith. There was once a famous poet in a land to the far, far east. Now in his twilight years, his ability had withered such that he could no longer craft a single stanza or verse. The poor poet spent every moment racked with sorrow for what had been lost, but one day a monk appeared by his side, gently placed a blade in his hand, and imparted the following words. Level 2. Kill one by this blade for one poem, and two for two in kind, the likes of which will be more splendid than any this world has ever heard. Clinging to the monk's words, the man waited for the cover of darkness and cut down a man he encountered by the roadside. The following day, he wrote a most beautiful poem, instantly reclaiming the fame and prosperity he had lost. Level 3. The poet went on to kill two in succession. He killed one and wrote a poem, then killed again and wrote another, rising to almost dazzling levels of wealth and renown. But soon he became obsessed with knowing how splendid a poem he might write if he were to kill someone precious to him. Level 4. He killed his wife and wrote a poem. He killed his children and wrote a poem for each. He moved through his estate, killing everyone there, writing and writing and writing and writing. Eventually, he killed so many passers-by that the poems could not keep up. He would kill and write and then kill and kill and kill and kill, until in the end, he took his own life, no longer crafting poems at all. All that remained was a blade wet with blood. Count still at zero, and I am not optimistic for that to ever change. Next up, Ancient Overlord. There was once a royal sword passed down in a prodigious kingdom that had prospered for generations. It was said the crystal embedded upon it contained a great magic, and should it ever absorb the blood of 10,000 people, it would glow bright red and grant its wielder immortality. However, this kingdom's final ruler, known to the world as the High King, valued the continued prosperity of the kingdom he'd inherited from his ancestors over any prospect of eternal life. Level 2 One day, the queen, the king's dearest love, lost her life in a tragic accident. She was with child, and the tragedy occurred shortly before the babe was to be born. Disgruntled with grief upon hearing the news, the aged king found himself unable to accept the prospect of his royal bloodline dying with him. Level 3 in an attempt to continue the kingdom's legacy by attaining a body without death, the now mad High King used the sword to cut down any and all subordinates or citizens unlucky enough to cross his path. If I'm to be the final king, he was heard to cry, then the kingdom survives so long as I live. Level 4 He killed his subjects by the dozens, the hundreds, the thousands. And with each life he stole, the crystal's life grew more radiant. But when the crystal was nearly full, the king's ailing heart proved unable to bear the burden and burst, killing him on the spot. Alas, had he just slain the pregnant woman and unborn child that were before his very eyes, he would have taken exactly 10,000 lives. Next up, the Phoenix Dagger. That's a very weird shaped one, I've never equipped it before. There was once a woman who promised her hand to a man who was departing for the front. Devout by nature, she spent mornings, afternoons, and evenings in prayer for the safety of her beloved. Perhaps in response to her earnest pleas, one night a bird enveloped in light appeared to her in a dream and began to speak. Level 2 The man you love will surely return safely, said the bird in a beautiful voice. These words brought great comfort to the woman, and she began weeping tears of joy. However, continued the bird, his heart will surely not. Level 3 Soon, the man returned as the bird had foretold, his body covered in scars beyond counting. But as the bird had also foretold, he returned with an unfamiliar woman of extraordinary beauty at his side. Despite this, the pious woman could not contain her love for the man and ran out to meet him as he approached. Level 4 Surprised, the man embraced her, then collapsed to the ground. The pious woman stood over him, a bloody dagger in one hand and the ripe crimson fruit of his heart in the other. His heart will stray no longer, she whispered. 
Amidst the gathering pool of blood, her face awash with pure ecstasy, she placed a tender kiss on her beloved's heart and offered a prayer of gratitude. Next up, Labyrinth's Whisper. So this girl had a huge set of horns on her. Beautiful horns like a bull, just growing out of her head above her ears. I had myself a gander at where the horns met the head, and let me tell you, they were coming straight out of her skull. She was the only kid like that in the whole village. The others were all normal. The kid with the horns, though? Born real small, apparently. The horns were, I mean, not the kid. Hell, they would have needed to be. Fat chance the kid's mama would have been able to push out a pair of horns huge as that. <laughs> Level 2. You think a kid like that would be bullied, right? Well, you'd be wrong. That kid was the hardest person for miles in any direction. It wasn't a man in the village who tangled with her. And we're talking men who ain't scared of nothing. She was the best at doing work that needed physical strength and all that, and she always led the charge whenever Shades attacked. Folks loved her for that, sure, but most of all they loved her because she was always cheerful and just plain tough. Level 3. But one day, this huge shade attacked the village that was just too strong. It tore the men apart like old rags, and half the guys in the village died. The girl with the horns fought with all she had, but eventually she couldn't keep up, and the shade lifted her off the ground and ripped the horns right out of her head. The way she screamed was like nothing you ever heard. Sound shook the earth itself, it did. After that, things got real quiet, so I stepped outside and found both the shade and the girl dead. Each of them had wounds all over, and they were leaking blood out of just about everywhere. And don't judge me for saying this now, but it was almost beautiful. Like looking at dark red flowers in full bloom, you know? Level 4. I hope that answers your question about why folks in this village can't hear nothing. But as you should know, none of us think badly of the girl for making us this way. Being deaf is a hell of a sight better than being dead. <laughs> anyway, uh, we've all talked over that day to death, and we think that final scream was her way of saying goodbye. Everyone in the village is honored that the last thing we heard was her farewell, and that's the God's honest truth. Next, the Fool's Embrace. I was saved from the despair that shackled me. I was free from the fate that cursed me. I was pacified from the indignation that plagued me. I was changed by the day I met you. Level 2. My flames will scorch the earth below. My fangs will know the taste of blood. My claws will rend my enemies asunder. My wings will soar through the skies above. Level 3. If your eyes are to be robbed of their light, if your skin is to be stained with blood, if your sword is too heavy a burden, if your lips can no longer produce speech. Level 4. Even if this body is snuffed out, even if these words are stolen, until our contract is complete, until the moment this warmth is lost. Next up, the Iron Pipe. This, I believe, this is the last weapon I uh, acquired, and it is the weapon which uh, Nier is fighting with in the very opening scene in the apocalyptic past cityscape with the snow and whatnot. Or, I guess that, that probably wasn't even snow, was it? That was probably, like, the remains of the, uh, of that great dragon guard monster that had just sort of rained down on the, uh, on the city below. Maybe it was snow. They were dressed pretty warm. Who knows, man. This one looks a little bit more direct. Interesting. May 21st. We finally run out of money. Food just costs a lot more nowadays because of the war. We tried begging at the church, but they have their hands full caring for the wounded and can't spare anything. Yona's really lost a lot of weight. I wish I could get her something to eat. Level 2. July 15th. We met a nice lady who gave us some food. At first I thought she was homeless like us, but she said she was joining some kind of relief and support thing run by the government, so we decided to go with her. At least Yona seems to be doing okay today. Level 3. August 1st. That nice lady from before used a book and turned into a monster. We ran away as fast as we could because I don't think she's human anymore. Everything those adults told us was a lie. They won't give us money and they won't treat Yona's illness. Also, there's a huge wall around the city now, and we can't get out. We never should have come here. Level 4. It's so cold today. I can't believe it's summer. I actually, I can actually see my breath. We decide to hide from the monsters in an abandoned supermarket. We found a few old cans of food there, but now those are gone. Also, Yona's cough just won't quit. I've got a really bad feeling about this. 
now, okay. That's it for the swords. I think, I think there are some additional swords uh, that are not collectible yet. Maybe they're just like DLC items or something. I'm not 100% sure. I'm like, I'm seeing in this list, interestingly, on the internet, some more swords that are, uh, some more one-handed swords that are not listed here, but game says I got 100% and I trust game. So let's go to the two-handed swords. This is totally going to be the entire episode today. <laughs> I'm looking at the clock and yeah, it's actually going to be quite long too. So enjoy story time, I guess. Uh, as much as you're able. Uh, Kusanagi. The shield left hanging on the wall was covered in dust. The blade left in its scabbard had rusted over. The techniques I hadn't used were forgotten. The body I was to train was left to grow soft. I had lost the will to practice discipline. Level 2. I thought things would end without a single word said. I pretended not to see violence inflicted by others. I had given up, assuming things would never change. I believed there was no way to oppose such a great power. I sneered at hearts that tried to believe anyway. Level 3. I laughed, thinking them brainless fools. Those were the thoughts I had taken refuge in. I'd given up, believing nothing was possible in the end. I lamented the foolishness and ugliness of it all. My life had lost all meaning. Level 4. I had lost sight of those who were precious to me. I could not believe in their kindness. I was unable to save them from the grief that tore at their hearts. I had forgotten the courage it takes to protect the smallest of joys. I believed my words would never reach you. So that one's not like... It's not not sad, so I don't think it adds to the tally, but that one's at least just kind of melancholy and not outright horrific slash depressing, so... Not, it doesn't get a point, but noteworthy, <laughs> I guess. Acts of beheading. Okay, there's no way this one's getting a point. There once was a ritual gathering of spirits held on the night of the tenth full moon of the year. During the ceremony, they would gather on the shores of a lake and boast to one another of all the evil deeds they had performed during the year. Level 2. The first spirit took great joy in telling of the unfathomably cruel ways she had killed some of the finest soldiers in the land. Over the years, she had transformed her shape into a lady of the night and called out to various men, then tore off every last piece of their body when they came to her bed. The soldiers, ashamed their skills could not save them, shed bitter tears as they died, and the spirit claimed they were the most delicious thing she'd ever tasted. Level 3. The next spirit regaled the others with a story of cunning and guile. One night, she threw a small boy into a bog. When his older sister came to rescue him, she too sank into the murk. These two were followed by their parents, then other siblings, then extended relatives, until finally every member of the village was sleeping at the bottom of the bog. When the spirit finished her story, she was so beside herself with glee that she did not even notice the saliva that dripped down her chin. Level 4. Nervously, the smallest spirit in the group stepped forward to address the crowd. I'm the most amazing of us all, cried the oft-ridiculed spirit at the top of her lungs, for it was I who thrust all living creatures into terror's deepest depths. The other spirits, unable to contain their mirth, collapsed to the ground and rolled about, and their laughter did not cease until the horrifying monster the small spirit summoned from the demon world devoured each and every last one of them. Next up, Fang of the Twins. We've been together since we were born. We're together when we eat, when we sleep, and when we dream. Level 2. We share everything. We share the milk we get from Mommy and the nice things Daddy says to us. Level 3. But we're not together when we die. Daddy took me and cut off my head, and Mommy took my sister and cut off her head. Level 4. But it's okay. Our blood got all mushed up into a big axe, so now we can be together forever. Next up, the Vile Axe. The girl stares at the sight before her. Her father lies nearby, carved to pieces by countless blades. Her mother also lies dying, as well as her newborn baby brother. All had suffered terribly in their final moments, and the girl can do nothing but cry as she stares at the three soldiers who have murdered her family. Level 2. Years later, the girl reappears, her visage made strong by her vow for revenge. 
The first soldier has grown so fat that the buttons on his uniform can barely contain his girth. The girl approaches him and claims to know an easy way to lose weight. On the pretext of an examination, she has him lie down on a bed, before suddenly hacking off his arms and legs with an axe. The remaining lump of soldier screams and attempts to wriggle away, but the girl pins him down and tells him he still has parts he can lose. Sometime later, the girl sits in front of the now rounded torso and smiles. There we are, she whispers. Look how nice and slim you are. Level 3 The second soldier is a peerless Lothario. Each night, a new woman is invited to his manor to spend the night. The girl breaks into his home and kills the women at his side, then uses her axe to hack off his manhood as he trembles to and begs for mercy. Level 4 The third soldier has long since left the service, and is now living a quiet life with his family in a remote village. After they have fallen asleep, the girl takes her axe and cleaves the support beams of the house, causing it to collapse. She then sets fire to the wreckage, creating a great bonfire that can be seen for miles in all directions. Suddenly, the soldier's son crawls from the wreckage, covered from head to toe in terrible burns. As his eyes fall on the girl who has murdered his family, she hands him her axe and flees into the dark of night, never to be seen again. Next up, the Beast Lord. Long ago, in a faraway kingdom, there were three brothers. The eldest brother was a king who ruled over the nation entire. He was a most terrifying king, feared by all. Level 2. Each day, the king would select one of his subjects to execute as a sacrifice. This day, he chopped off a mother's head and forced her family to watch. The head spun three times as it flew through the air before landing next to the head of her son, who the king had previously killed. Oh, the horror of it all. But the king merely watched the sight unfold before him and laughed in a most unsettling voice. Level 3. One day, the king contracted an illness most dire, one which caused his body to rot while he was still alive. But though deceased, the king would still drag his decaying flesh to the executions all the same. His retainers dared not defy their king, so they continued to kill day after day, after day, after day. Level 4 In the end, the king rotted and died. His was a disgusting, foul, rotten death but his retainers continued carrying out executions before the king's rotted corpse every day. Every day, killing. Every day, the rotted king, and the rotted retainers, and the rotted citizens, and the rotted you. Next up, the Iron Will. Now, this one, I believe, is the weapon which we were given in a, like, a kind of busted up form from the brother. Uh, the surviving brother in the junk heap, and then we, uh, in story, kind of went and grabbed a material so he could upgrade it. I think that's this one. Uh, so we've got it to level two, as a result. Uh, all right. I raise the cry of my birth. The sound of heated iron taking shape, a steel mallet striking my form. Born to deliver karmic justice, I enter the world under the careful watch of spark and flame that give light to the gloom. I'm a blade born of a deafening roar. I'm a weapon. I am Iron Will. Level 2. I grant death. I transform the dread and screams of my foes to elation. I festoon my iron skin with their viscera. When I rob them of life, I am filled with dark joy. When I crush them beneath me, I find meaning in my birth. And I continue to kill, that I might share this delight with all. I kill and kill and kill and kill. I am a weapon. I am Iron Will. Level 3. I am shattered. At battle and blood's end, my body is torn asunder by malice and hate. Today I again engage the Red Dragon in battle, and magical forces meet leaping iron fangs to create a bloodstorm. My steel cursed, I sink into the slumbering black. I am a weapon. I am Iron Will. Level 4. I dream. It is the dream of a small butterfly. In it, the butterfly is caught in a light rain, struggling against it with all its might. In the darkest of nights, I behold a dream that will never come true. I am a weapon. I am Iron Will. So that mention of the Red Dragon is interesting and makes me think this is a weapon straight out of Dragon Guard. In fact, I bet several of these have been. I'm not familiar enough with the weapons in Dragon Guard to say, but I bet several of them have been. And in comments, I'm guessing at least a handful of you do know, so please do post down there and let us know, because I'm curious to find out.
Next up, the Phoenix Sword. This is a story of a time long, long ago. There was once a beautiful bird with resplendent feathers that lived a quiet life deep in the forest. One day, a lost child wandered into the woods. He came from a place of famine, and had been abandoned in the forest as a way to reduce the number of mouths to feed. Taking pity on the feeble, starving child, the beautiful bird plucked one of its own feathers and- Wait a minute, I'm sorry, I'm, in, I'm into level two now, you- I guess you can probably tell that. Taking pity on the feeble, starving child, the beautiful bird plucked one of its own feathers and gave it to him. When he returned home, his family was overjoyed by the feather, and permitted him to live with them once more. Level 3. Hearing the child's story, one person after another descended on the forest to tell the bird how poor and unfortunate they were. Each time, the bird would pluck a feather and give it away, pluck a feather and give it away, until it had no more to give, and its once beautiful visage had become shabby beyond recognition. But the shabby bird had no regrets. Level 4. One day, the original child appeared before the shabby bird, which was featherless and freezing in the cold. He had come seeking a bird with resplendent feathers that he might repay the creature's earlier kindness. Overjoyed, the shabby bird said to the child, It is I you seek. If I might beg a favor, would you hold me to your chest and warm my freezing body? Sparing a single glance at the shabby bird, the child called it a liar and cut it down with a large blade. He then roasted the bird, ate every last part, and set out anew to find the beautiful bird who had once saved his life. Y'all thought that was gonna go, like, positive, and y'all should know better. Next up, the Labyrinth's Song. It was a beast that lived in a cavern's deepest, most untouched depths. It had massive horns, a body like steel, breath of scorching fire. The peace-loving villagers hated this monstrous beast with the head of a bull and the body of a human. They feared it, and soon the beast came to be known as the Minotaur of the Labyrinth. Level 2 Contrary to its terrifying appearance, the Minotaur was exceptionally kind. Not only did it refrain from harming other creatures, it took great care not to trample flowers beneath its oafish feet as it walked. Indeed, the reason it lived so deep inside a cavern was to help avoid frightening the villagers. Level 3 one day, a lost girl wandered into the beast's cavern. Frightened by the sight of it, she cried so hard she eventually passed out, which left the beast in quite the quandary. I have no choice, the beast finally decided. I must take the poor thing back to the village, for her mother and father will be terribly worried. Level 4 Two days after the girl vanished, her panicked parents found her sleeping soundly in front of their home. On the ground, a short distance away, was the body of the Minotaur. It had been impaled by several swords, and the blood scattered around it held an almost otherworldly quality. Yet there was no indication the beast had attacked the girl. In fact, it looked as though it had been trying to place as much distance between itself and her as possible, so as not to dirty her with its blood, almost as if it didn't want her to be afraid. And then, having curled up to make itself as small as possible, the monster died. Next up, and possibly last, yep, our last of the two-handed swords anyway, we still gotta get to the spears. Fool's Lament. This is another one of those, I think Fool's Anything are the weapons that we got from the uh, little DLC battle stuff in uh, Nier's Mom's Diary. And this looks interesting indeed. Memoir, June 6th, 2003, approximately 1500 hours. A massive white humanoid, initially called the Weapon but since renamed the Giant, falls from the sky above Tokyo's Shinjuku Ward, inflicting tremendous damage. At the same time, a large red creature, henceforth referred to as the Dragon, appears and engages the giant in combat, though both the nature of its attacks and their utility remain unclear. As the self-defense force contemplates methods by which they might attack the target, the government establishes a Bureau of Emergency Countermeasures. Level 2 And this, this is straight up telling us that what happens in that Drakengard ending. Probably from a slightly different perspective, but in any case, this is, this is the connection. Level 2. June 12th, 2003, approximately 1600 hours. The giant, which was locked in combat with the dragon, suddenly begins to collapse for reasons unknown. The dragon is then shot down by the 6th Division, 303rd Squadron of the Air Self-Defense Force. No official record exists of who issued the order to attack the dragon. 
Work is begun to retrieve the remains of both the giant and the dragon, but no official verification has ever been made regarding which organization performed the retrieval. Level 3. Memoir, December 2003. The first case of white chlorination syndrome is confirmed in Tokyo's Shinjuku ward. So, okay, about six months after that event, that's when white chlorination syndrome, the disease, the black scrawl, uh, starts surfacing. And the it's the beginning of the end. Level 4. Memoir, July 2004. Humans continue to turn violent due to white chlorination syndrome, with fighting growing increasingly intense in infected regions. With the cause of the disease still unclear, the infected are isolated and violent riots suppressed by force. Main thoroughfares are sealed and rail transportation is halted, later leading to all of Shinjuku being sealed off. At this time, the prospect of asking the American military for non-official intervention is considered, but the government defers. Meanwhile, research begins on Maso particles, obtained from the giant and the dragon, as well as on countermeasures for white chlorination syndrome. This research ultimately leads to the founding of Project Gestalt a decade later. Actually, I should clarify, the black scrawl thing that we are dealing with now is not, I don't think, the same as the white chlorination syndrome. At least, that's my understanding. I think the black scrawl has more to do with the sort of, uh, like, issues with both the shades and the replicants, and they're kind of going corrupt or going haywire. I think white chlorination syndrome is just the disease that was, uh, afflicting folks. I may be, like, maybe there's a connection there. Comments, clarify that one for me too. There's so much about Lear, about near lore that you can get a lot of it from in the games themselves, but a lot of it is pretty vague and sometimes we're, like, relies on outside, uh, sources to fully clarify and answer those questions. So if anybody knows the answers, by all means, please let us know. But that about does it for the two-handed swords. Now it is time for spears. This is taking much longer than I thought, but I don't know. I'm enjoying it, sort of. <laughs> Transience. They were a frighteningly diligent people. They would clear forests and hunt animals even when they had no need. They developed techniques to preserve food they were unable to eat and earned more money than could ever be spent. Yet there was not a single one among them who did not accept these practices, for none knew of any other customs. Level 2. They were a frighteningly studious people. Their grasp of calculation and science exceeded any pretense of practicality, and they would repeatedly engage in spirited debates regarding predictions of the future. They invented an increasingly difficult language, and created an infinite series of complex machines which they would immediately discard. But there was not a single one among them who looked back, for none knew of any reason for concern. Level 3 They were a frighteningly obedient people. Without ever being told, they would greet the morning sun at the same time, in the same clothes, while toiling away in the same cramped rooms. Yet there was not a single one among them who complained, for none knew what else they should be doing. Level 4 Having worked far too much, the people lost their forests and took to living atop the sand. Having grown far too intelligent, the people conversed in a language that no other peoples could comprehend. Having grown far too well behaved, the people were unable to defy the laws that would be established one after the other, and came to live their lives enclosed by tens of thousands of rules. Hey, the facade origin story. Neat. Next up, Spear of the Usurper. In a far-off land, there was a man who acted as a double for the nation's prince, performing duties in his stead as was required. One day, having finished his work, he returned to the prince's chamber to find the princess lying naked in his bed. As the double stood in place, dumbfounded, the man who shared his face sneered and invited him to join them. Level 2 The double loved the prince's sister, and he felt that the princess, who admired him as her brother, loved him as well. Indeed, she was the only thing that kept him going in an otherwise miserable job, for the prince was a most despicable man indeed. Level 3 Eventually, it came to pass that a war was to be waged under the prince's command. The night before it was to begin, the prince took his double aside and promised him a night with his sister if he could bring him the head of the enemy general. And as the prince chuckled with delight, the double took up his spear and thrust it through the prince's gaping mouth. Level 4 The war over, the prince made a queen of his sister and would inflict wounds upon his own face and throat, an act which would occur every time she called out to him using her brother's name. 
Before long, the prince was found dead, his face burned and a spear thrust through his open mouth. The man's face, hideously burned, was the very picture of serenity. Next, the Devil Queen. This story takes place in a small country at around the same latitude as the northernmost member of a nation of city-states that are part of a region with a village that is attempting to establish a trade agreement with another village on a tiny island in the ocean south of a country that used to have an alliance with a republic next to a kingdom where a queen resided. That is a sentence. Level 2. It was asked by the owner of a shop frequented by a wet nurse who looked after the child born of an adulterous relationship by the wife of the master of a foolish servant who fell in love with a beautiful queen who appears in the poems of a minstrel whom was loved by the country's king's wife's little brother's cousin's big brother's son-in-law foster's child. <clears throat> Should have taken a breath in there somewhere. <laughs> Level 3. Where does one store the throne that was supposed to be adorned with decorations crafted from the materials of the handle of the lid of a pot that is the same weight as tableware that is the same color as a weather vane on a neighboring house that can be seen from the peephole of a door in the reflection of a mirror from an ornamental frame decorated with silver carvings engraved with a fragment that was made when creating the whetstone used to polish this kitchen knife. And finally, level four, and this one's going to be challenging. The person who heard that question was the wife's husband's little sister's big brother's daughter's groom's little brother's nephew's father's mother's husband's bride's niece's father-in-law's wife's husband's little sister's big brother's daughter's groom's little brother's nephew's father's mother's husband's bride's niece's father-in-law's wife's husband's little sister's big brother's daughter's groom's little brother's nephew's father's mother's husband's bride's niece's father's in-law's wife's father's little sister's big brother's daughter's groom's little brother's nephew's father's nephew's father's mother's husband's bride's niece's father-in-law's wife's husband's little sister's big brother's daughter's groom's little father's nephew's father's and that's the end. <laughs> it's pretty good. <laughs> you know what? I'm giving that one a point. That's pretty good. <laughs> one point. We did it. I don't think there was anything actually that tragic in that one. <laughs> Game, you did it. Anyway, back to tragedy. Sunrise. I'm out of breath. <laughs> In the distant past of a land known as the Golden Isle, there existed a sword crafted from every kind of metal and precious gem in the land. So sharp was its edge that even the slightest cut would leave an unsealable wound that eventually drained the victim of both their blood and life. In a strange turn of fate, level two by the way, the sword eventually ended up in the hands of a destitute woman who sold her body to get by. The sword was as long as she was tall, and she could not wield it effectively, so instead she slid it between her sheets as a surprise for the men who used her. The sword was so sharp they felt no pain when cut, and soon died without even knowing it was happening. The woman would then help herself to their coin, causing their own purse to swell. Level 3 Making use of her gains, the woman dressed most beautifully and soon had acquired every kind of metal and precious gem in the land, but it was not enough for her. So she decided to melt down the sword and obtain the gems hidden in within, a desire made manifest by the sword's beauty. Thus decided, the woman heaved the sword to her shoulders and made for the blacksmith. Level 4 But on the way to the smith, the sheer weight of the sword caused the woman to lose her balance, and she fell from a bridge into the river below. So unshakable was the woman's greed that she would not bring herself to relinquish her grip upon it. The woman's pale and bloodless corpse was found washed up on the riverside the following day. Next up, Beast Curse. Long, long ago, in a faraway kingdom, there lived three brothers. The youngest was a terrifically lazy lad who spent most of his days fast asleep. However, he was every bit as cheerful as he was lethargic, and so was beloved by all. Level 2. When the nation was beset upon by a most contagious disease, the youngest son did naught but laze about the palace, humming to himself all the while. But his cheerful music comforted the townspeople, so instead of hating him, they sang his praises. Oh, what a fine young man, they would say. Just the finest young man you will ever find. Level 3 When the nation became embroiled in war, the youngest son did naught but laze about the palace, telling stories of the good old days all the while. But his fascinating stories helped the townspeople forget the horrors of war, so instead of hating him, they sang his praises. Oh, what an amazing young man, they would say. Just the most amazing young man you will ever find. Level 4 One day, the youngest son was lazing about the palace, as usual, 
when he realized he could no longer hear the voices of the townspeople, and he wondered why that might be. He lazed, and he wondered. He lazed, and he wondered. He lazed, and he wondered. Eventually, all that wondering tired him out, and he went to sleep. That is why, in that nation where all have perished from war and disease, the only sound that can be heard is the soft snoring of a young man. It is a nation of happiness. A nation of happiness. A nation of happiness. A nation of happiness. The Captain's Holy Spear. Oh, that one's nice and short. This is all going to be nice and short. Okay. Level 1. The Captain tramples life under his feet. Level 2. The screams of others transform into songs of joy. Level 3. Flowing tears change from despair into darkness. Level 4. Conflict beckons revenge and gives way to new solitude. Nice and brief. Next up, the Dragoon Lance. He had grown old. The king's dauntless gaze had lost its light, and his stalwart body had grown soft. What's more, every ounce of fear and vanity he had gained with age now gnawed away at his heart. The king was afraid, so he repeatedly ordered the invasion of neighboring countries so as to hold onto the lands he'd been sworn to protect. The king was afraid, so he tried to take everything through violence and oppression, for he no longer trusted his own advisors and vassals. Level 2. There was a dragon that had sworn fealty to the king. This wingless creature would do anything the king commanded, for he had been saved by the king once, and sworn to repay this debt with his very soul. Even if the king's orders were folly and madness, the dragon would follow them to the last, for his king was justice itself. Level 3. One day, the dragon requested an audience with the king. He was covered in blood from his latest victim, the king's own son, who the regent had ordered the dragon to assassinate. The bloody dragon hung his head low and said, I cannot defy your orders, O king, but neither can I obey them any longer. I beg of you, kill me and grant me release. This, level four. This is the tale of a foolish king and a wingless dragon in a nation that fell centuries ago. Even now, the wind blows ceaselessly across the grasslands. It blows just as it did on the day King and Dragon made their pact. Humans making pacts with dragons, by the way, is a dragon guard thing, so I'm guessing this is another direct reference to something. Anyway, the Phoenix Spear. We're in the home stretch, people. We're going to make it. Heck, I can just read this one straight from the game. This will be a novelty. There was once a warrior in a frontier nation who feared not death. He was so brawny and powerful, arrows were said to bounce harmlessly off his flesh. For this reason, the warrior always threw himself into the thick of any battle. Level 2. One day, a beautiful bird appeared before the warrior in a dream. The bird commended the warrior for his valor in battle and offered to grant him one of two wishes. The bird could bring an end to war and grant peace to all the world, or the bird could bequeath the warrior an immortal body. The warrior chose immortality. Level 3. From that day forth, the warrior's exploits were nothing short of astonishing. He mowed down foes in uncountable numbers. No amount of arrows or swords or axes could slow his march. The king showered him with titles and gifts, and for a time it seemed the warrior's days of stunning glory would continue until the end of time. Level 4. But conflict did not cease. Eventually, the warrior's frontier nation was invaded so often that the flames of war left the entire country in ruins. Crops withered, people perished, and before long, there were none left who even knew the warrior's name. The shattered warrior was tortured day and night by endless starvation, but his body refused to let him die. So he sought out the bird again and pleaded for it to grant him release. Ah, but you cannot die, chirped the bird in response. You will never die. Next up, the Labyrinth's Shout. Back to the laptop. <laughs> she was a hopelessly slow woman. Impossibly clumsy, it would take her three times longer than anyone else to accomplish a task. She walked slowly, talked slowly. She even blinked slowly. So slow was the woman that she could not even draw water to anyone's satisfaction. The children began calling her the cow and laughing when she passed by, but she would only chuckle in response. Level 2. She was a hopelessly dull woman. When she fell and drew blood, 
she would carry on as though in a daze. Though coins often dropped from her purse, she never managed to retrieve one. And if someone spoke ill of her to her face, it would take hours for her to realize the insult. When the children saw her, they would hurl rocks with glee. Level 3 She was a hopelessly foolish woman. One summer, when the village was suffering a most terrible drought, the woman vanished. The children all starved to death. The villagers spent no time worrying about the woman who ran away. Two days later, rain fell and the village was saved, but the woman did not return. And on the twentieth day, a shaman arrived at the village. Level 4 The shaman held a spear with a pair of horns that was oiled and sticky to the touch. So heavy was the spear that none could wield it effectively, although even if they managed to lift it, the weapon was incapable of piercing through anything at all. The shaman forced it on the people and left it with them, but none dared approach it, and to this day, it quietly slumbers in a forgotten corner of the village. And finally, the last one! Fool's Accord. This is the story of a sorrowful prince, a tale of a kingdom in a time long past. Attacked by the forces of darkness, the nation was annihilated in a single night by inhuman soldiers with red eyes and a group of black dragons so numerous they blotted out the sky. This seems like another dragon guard thing. Having infiltrated the king's castle, the black dragons visited upon the king and queen a most horrible fate. It is said that their stomachs were torn open by the black dragon's mighty claws, and the very floor they stood upon became a sea of blood. The prince and princess, though racked with sorrow, escaped to live another day. The prince, spurred by the shock of witnessing his parents' tragic end, became consumed by a desire to exact vengeance. Level 2 This is the story of a terrifying prince, a history of conflict in the long ago. Obsessed with laying low his hated enemies, the prince indulges in his vengeance day after day after day. Even when faced with foes who take heel, he chases them down and tears them apart from groin to gullet. The carnage is so horrific, his fellow soldiers whisper tales of how they saw him mutilating bodies that are already long dead. Perhaps because no commander can control him, the prince is sent to an even harsher battle. Level 3 This is the story of a fooled prince, the whereabouts of fate in the long ago. The prince's next battleground is a castle that guards a goddess. He lays waste to all before him, hacking arms, cleaving legs, rending stomachs, gouging eyes, separating heads from shoulders. But soon, the injured prince can no longer tell the difference between the blood that rains down and that which comes from his own wounds, and he collapses in a heap. As he writhes in pain, coughing up gouts of hot blood, he lifts his gaze and sees a hated dragon standing before him. Level 4 This is the story of a mad prince, a meeting with a dragon in the long ago. An injured red dragon stands before the prince, and though it is a different color than the beasts that killed his parents, he feels the need to avenge himself upon it regardless. But as he raises his sword, the dragon says, In exchange for both our souls, human, I will save your life and grant you power. After some thought, the prince makes the pact. It matters not to him what he might lose in the deal, or that it involves a dragon. All he cares about is that he can continue swinging his blade. So he swings, and swings, and swings, and with each blow, his heart fills with a desire as black as the deepest night. And that is all of the weapons I have. That took longer than I thought. And boy, I know some of you enjoy listening to my voice reading things, and these, uh, <laughs> whenever we get to these text sections. Really hope some of y'all weren't using this one to, like, fall asleep by. <laughs> Those dreams are not going to be good. Y'all, thank you for watching. Um, we're still here, obviously, but this has been an hour. So I'm going to go ahead and go, uh, and I will see y'all tomorrow for Ending C of Near Replicant. Take care, everyone, and a goodbye.